Hello, I'm Matt Carpenter, and this is the Good Life Podcast. Hello, welcome to the Good Life Podcast. I'm Matt Carpenter, and I have today Dr. Scott Masson from Tyndale University in Toronto. Dr. Masson, thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me on, Matthew. Great to be here. So I first was introduced to Dr. Masson at the Academy of Philosophy and Letters conference this past year, and he presented on the, some of the romantic poets, and I got, it got me interested in watching his YouTube channel. His YouTube channel, he actually, as a college professor, has the courage to upload all of his lectures there. So I would say for everyone to please, if you're interested in literature, both ancient and more recent literature, uh, please check those out. But also, Dr. Matson, just tell us a little bit about your background growing up and, and how you arrived where you are at Tyndale. Okay, well, uh, I, I was born in London, Ontario, uh, not too far from Toronto, a couple of hours away, and um, uh, went to university in my hometown, a place called Huron College. I studied English and history there, and uh, went to Europe, lived in Germany for a while, and studied German and classical languages uh, uh, in German and uh, found my way back to study English uh, literature at the University of Durham in England. And interestingly, at that time, uh, two things happened. One, I found out that I was uh, actually native by background. My mother was uh, found out when her mother passed away uh, that uh, she had been adopted, and her parents hadn't told her. And uh, so that was an interesting piece of information that I did not know about myself and neither did she. So that's uh, interesting. Um, uh, the second thing is I became a Christian while I was at the University of Durham between my master's and PhD. And uh, that, again, was uh, even more significant for me. It meant having to rethink uh, all manner of things, my newfound faith. Um, was not just a personal turn to Christ, but it meant uh, as an academic, I had to think, what does it mean to be a Christian in the academy? And I hadn't really had to think that through before. So it was uh, it was not a quick process. Uh, some things were obvious, but other things really needed a lot of, uh, of thinking. So I did that and I'm still doing that. And I don't. There aren't many guides. There aren't many Christians in the academy uh, who will give you guidance on even what to read and how to think. Mm. And um, I found a few over the years, but uh, they were not presented to me immediately. And uh, I returned to Canada after I'd finished my PhD and had served in the church there for a bit, and uh, largely because of family circumstances. I wasn't married at the time. My family had various health issues and so forth. So I moved back and I've been here for almost 20 years back now. And so I came back, I left um, not as a Christian, I returned as a Christian. Canada was very different when I returned and so was I. All right. So when we think of, when most Americans think of Canada, The older stereotypes are, you know, maple syrup and Mounties, <laughs> but <laughs> the modern ideas now are things like uh, truckers' protests, <laughs> yeah, and, and things like that. Hmm. So Canada's faced a lot of change, as you just said, in the last several decades. So how did it go from being, for example, recently I gave a talk on Stephen Leacock. Oh. And, and his work. 
at both on behalf, you know, as an economist and a writer. And certainly a lot has changed since then. How did Canada go from being a place that could produce someone like Stephen Leacock to a place that now has uh, Premier Trudeau as the supreme leader? Yeah, <laughs> that's a nice way of putting him, supreme leader. <laughs> he might like that. Um, well, that is what Canadians themselves, or at least those who were born here and grew up here, are wondering themselves. I think that's a very disorienting experience um but i'm not sure it's that different being an american and seeing what's happened in the u.s as well it's uh uh memories of of childhood and what life was like then seem very different from the way things are now um and how that came about well it's it's um uh, all it, that's that's a probably quite a complicated discussion Sure. Uh, globalism is one of the issues. Uh, globalism has brought the world uh, together in a way that was not imaginable before. Uh, the internet is really a significant factor, I think, in changing um, and connecting people. And with connections, uh, stronger identities uh, are forged away from the people around you and the people around you are less important than uh, they would have been. Uh, you know, even kids in the playground look at their cell phones uh, and chat to each other through the cell phone, which they could be chatting to somebody on the other side of the world. It wouldn't matter. So I think there's a bit, a bit of the, it is technology, um, which is alienating from, from place and time. Uh, it does mean that you can, circumvent that so i can be on a video chat with somebody in australia or in africa and i am involved in those from time to time as you may be as well it's quite extraordinary it's like tolkien's uh seeing stones the palantir he uses in the lord right. of the rings but there's something quite extraordinarily powerful with that but it does give you a sense of uh dislocation uh there's that and then there's the politics, the agenda that's gone along with that. And uh, the party of technology tends to be the party of the left because it, it emphasizes big government and uh, solutions from on high. Um, and technology, to some degree, requires there to be no impediments for it to work well. And so the, the two have worked hand in glove, I'd say. And uh, that's certainly the case in Canada. Canada has been... Uh, often defined itself by what it's not you know mm. we're not american uh, right we're not british now would our and according to our current prime minister trudeau um we're also post-national we're not you know we don't have an identity as a nation at all and uh he identifies himself by what i'm not exactly sure but it seems to be you know the un and its agendas so I mean, Canada has, I think, more ripe for that than other countries, but even countries with a strong national uh, heritage like the United States are going down the same path. Right. Yes. One of the, 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 the talks on your YouTube page, I think it's the first one that comes up, is one you gave on cultural Marxism. Uh -huh. That has a a unique ring to it. Still, a, a lot of people, if they, if they don't pay attention to more recent terms, they, they've certainly heard of Marxism when they were in mm -hmm. high school, mm -hmm. but they think of it as that thing that Karl Marx started that the Soviet Union tried and depending on who your teacher is, may, you know, it did or didn't work, you know, pretty, pretty, reasonably most people say it failed but right. what that actually means is a different story but in in your talk you push past the older economic version of marxism 
to, to something that, you know, to w- what it has evolved into. So, so talk, you know, tell us, I know you, one could watch, I'd recommend the entire hour long talk that you gave there, but what is cultural Marxism and what makes it more dangerous than the older version of Marxism? So I gave that talk eight years ago. I know because it was around the birth of my son. So it, uh, I, I remember it pretty well, uh, the timeline and, and Prime Minister Trudeau. I talked about Trudeau. I mentioned Trudeau very early on in it and, and quoted him. But the Trudeau I quoted was his father. And, right. uh, and he, he was talking about the, uh, the unborn having, having certain rights. Um, it wasn't an absolute right, but they had certain rights. And I noted that his son, who was not the leader of the country at the time, would have thrown him out of the party if he'd made such a statement because it would have sound, he would have sounded like a conservative. Right. And uh, so Trudeau was <laughs> contradicting Trudeau and that, you know, the audience initially might have thought that uh, it was a statement from Justin when it was fact his father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was a radical himself and I think a Marxist. Right. In his uh, in his worldview, friend of Fidel Castro, um, rumors about Castro being uh, Justin's father as well. I don't need to get into that, but <laughs> no, I mean, the, it's out there. I have no idea. There are certain similarities for sure. Um, but um, what's difficult at, about it, or what's more insidious about it, is that it's not as direct and it's not as uh, uh, yeah, it, it's not as direct in its approach. So uh, economic Marxism was a violent political movement. It happened by means of revolutions, like it did in Russia, and like it did in many areas in Europe and happened in Cuba and elsewhere. There tends to be a party that represents the workers, um, or so they say, uh, and they're going to seize the means of production uh, from the masters, the factory owners, whatever. And uh, that was the playbook for a while. It didn't really work in the West. The, uh, and this is one of the things that distressed the Marxists. They couldn't understand why the common man was not on board with this. The cultural Marxists observed that, firstly, that it wasn't popular in the West, despite Marx thinking it would be, and them thinking it would be. It didn't even happen when Marx said it would happen, the next worldwide conflict, World War I, didn't happen. World War II, didn't happen. The common man was, uh, was uh, supportive of his own country against the other countries when it came down to the things that divided nations. And uh, so what these thinkers realized is that there was a a solidarity with things that needed to be broken down before the revolution could take place. And the chief things that were impediments there were the family and, and the church, Christianity, Christian views of life. And, and so they, through various means, and there are various writers associated with this, they tend to be associated with the Frankfurt school. Um, uh, so-called in Frankfurt, Germany. Right. They um, said we have to do things to undermine the certitudes that everybody operates with, whether they are, even if they're not Christians, they still assume that the family unit is a social good and it's good for them personally as well as those nearest and dearest to them. We have to sort of undermine that in various ways because these are impediments to us bringing about the revolution we want to. Um, and so they have done that and, and it takes time to do it. It's a, it's a long, slow march and it happens through the institutions and it happens through all means of influence and that includes entertainment and, and media and likewise. And I think that roughly describes what has been happening during my lifetime over the course of our lifetimes Uh, but going back all the way to the 40s and 50s in Hollywood you can see a progressive shift on the uh, understanding of 
men and women relations between the sexes, um, the family, the portrait of children, the portrait of fathers, the portrait of women as mothers, or you know, under the guise of equality, but really not interested in political equality, more in interested in flattening differences, including sexual differences. And gender identity is just a the latest form of that. As we speak, the World Cup of soccer is about to take place in Qatar, Middle East, and there's big protests or noises being made against the fact that the regime there is, you know, not LGBT friendly. Uh, and people are complaining, how could we ever put this here? They're not worried about the fact that it's in a desert and, you know, it's not really a great place to play sports um, and shouldn't have been done on that basis. They're worried about that they're not LGBT friendly. Um, this was decided 12 years ago. The trans issue was not even an issue 12 years ago. It, it was not even mentioned, even in my country the T was not a part of it. There would be the, um, you know, the lesbians, the gay, there was the pride parades, but the T was not even there. But they're So the, the radical left, if you want to call them that, um, are, are moving along very quickly and are astonished that the world, even 12 years ago, isn't looking at things the way they are now because they're always looking to the future and they have contempt for the past and everything that represents the past. I will never think of Qatar when I think of soccer, but I know no. that's, that's, that's not the main point you were making there, no. but, but that, that is very, um, no, odd. but I mean the, the, the national teams, I don't know about the U S U S and Canada are both there, but, uh, the British, uh, the English national team, they wear a rainbow armband around that. And there's a, like on yeah, the captain's okay. armband, um, so they're pushing it very hard, um, and uh, it's an extraordinary thing for a for a, a sporting event. And the, the players themselves are being pushed to denounce the Qatari regime and so forth because they're not, uh, oh boy. you know, progressive enough. But that's it's it's just an illustration of what we're talking about in this long, long slow march. Well, how long and how slow? Well, that was twelve years ago. It, Nobody, nobody raised an objection on those issues 12 years ago. Right. So <laughs> where are the breaks then? I mean, what, what, I mean, is there a, it, at what point does the rubber band snap as far as we're, we've stretched it? Well, that's an interesting analogy that of a rubber band. Um, and uh, I've often heard it presented as a pendulum, you know, and, and in politics, it goes to the right, comes back to the left, you know, the center and so forth. And that's, uh, that's the old way of looking at it, I think. And it assumes that there is a center to the current political uh, operations. And it would have been so at one point, and you would have been able to in politics to find a center, a point of common agreement uh, between the two sides of the political spectrum. And those would be called moderates, right? As opposed to the extremists. Okay, we've had right. the time when, you know, and, and the politicians would want to find that middle ground in order to get the votes necessary to please the electorate as a whole. But um, that idea of a middle ground is dependent on a notion of a common human nature and certain common values and certain common institutions which are equally valued whether you're on your the right or the left and the family would have been one of them and again the freedoms that go with uh western societies at any right the freedom of speech the freedom to assemble the freedom to worship etc um, those would have been valued as much on the left as they would be on the right. And, and now the freedoms are seen as uh, obsolete and a threat to the political order. Well, that's so <laughs> what we're saying there is the central ground on which both sides would have agreed are now politicized and are regarded as things that need to be uh, abrogated, done away with. Uh, that was part of the 
of Marcuse's point, one of the cultural Marxists of the 1960s, that our notion of tolerance uh, needed to be done away with. And, and they have done away with it. I think that that is the problem. We still talk in terms of left and right. We still talk about trying to be reasonable with one another, but the terms of engagement um, are fundamentally different now, and the left does not acknowledge them at all. And the right may, for what it so-called right, it may pay lip service to them. Do they actually think that liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to quote your uh, brethren, um, are things that are real and need right. to be defended? Or, or they, are they negotiable? Right. <laughs> that some of this reminds the, the language reminds me. Have you ever read uh, historian John Lukacs, uh, who's a Hungarian? Have you, have you heard of him or read him before? You're not talking about the cultural Marxist Lukacs. No, 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 no. This was uh, he was a man. He he <laughs> taught. He was a strong Roman Catholic. Uh, emigrated to the United States and taught at Chestnut Hill College for decades. He died. I've heard of him, but I have not read him. So he, he has a book called Democracy and Populism. Right. Which is really good. because the way, And the way he probably wrote it 15 or 20 years ago, but the way he diagnoses what we are seeing now yeah, I mean, because of course it wasn't going on. LGBT, the hard push that we see is not what we're. He was not seeing that, but he was predicting that at this point, all all one has to do with the advent of greater technology, you don't have a monarch or uh, an aristocracy that can kind of, that can moderate the emotions of the people. So you have people who can, they take their message directly to the people and for very negative ends to simply get what they want. And they bypass the, he would consider them kind of the mediating influences of longstanding monarchs or aristocratic families who would, who would in the past temper the, the strong emotions of the, the populace. So his point was that we are now at a time when, when it's, it's easy to manipulate the public. It is easier to manipulate the public than it has been in the past. So his, yeah. he, he was predicting in some ways kind of what you were saying that this idea of, of the pendulum swinging back and forth is not something we can rely on. No, I think that's right. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, and this was the objection of the Brit British to the American Revolution, whatever you make of that, is that this uh, rule of the people, by the people, for the people, ends up working against the people, that there is right. no... And, and I think the founders recognized that the, the, the movement uh, associated with their own civil war the, the, on the radical left, the levelers that wanted to get rid of every check and balance on the will of the people would be very problematic for the public good. And so they tried to institute those, uh, and they are there in your, in your own uh, national public and political life. But uh, democracy radically understood is it dissolves all social bonds. It makes everything about the individual and his desires and those are not checked by any sense of obligation or a higher um, authority to whom one is accountable or even uh, a natural unit to which to whom one owes one's life the, the family um, those can all be sacrificed radically and technology allows you to do that it gives you the power to uh, go beyond your own natural limitations. And, and uh, if you add that collectively 
it, it does lead to a sort of a collectivism, which we saw a characteristic of the Soviet Union and communist China. Right. Switching gears some, uh, you, you, you teach several classes at, at Tyndale right now, and, and I can't precisely, I, I don't know what the names of them are. I know one it seems to be just it, it is on ancient literature. So, so could you just tell me what what are the classes you're currently teaching this semester? This semester, it's a survey class is the one you're identifying. I start with Homer in the ancient world, and and we're moving up to um, let's see here. We finish in the early 17th century. Okay, John Donne. George Herbert and so forth. And then next semester, we begin with John Milton and go to the contemporary. So it's just a survey, but it's a survey not just of English literature, it's more of Western literature. It's a sort of a great books okay. uh, class. And uh, originally, when I came to the university, one of the reasons I came is it was put alongside philosophy and history uh, so that students would do, while they're doing Homer with me, they'd be reading. Herodotus or uh, uh, one of the Greek historians. Um, and in philosophy, they'd be reading Aristotle and, and Plato or the pre-Socratics. And then they'd, we'd mm. move onward through the historical periods and the student would be given a sense of uh, context in all of these. And, and what would result from that would be a sense of how where I'm at a Christian university, how Christianity had transformed the ancient world and uh, what, what we owed the ancient world and could still learn from it, but also how we had made progress from that until we get to the Enlightenment, at which point what becomes Christendom moves towards post-Christendom. And uh, that's part of the cultural Marxist uh, observations we're talking about, we've just talked about. But it's helpful to see things uh, historically, sequentially, to show the commonalities, but also where the differences come. Because we, we look at things through the media and all around us, and it tends to see things in only one way. And it's useful to see that it was not always seen the way we see it. And actually, in some ways, um, those who wrote and lived in the past see things a lot more clearly than we do and are helpful. Mm -hmm. So well, that's the one class. The other is C.S. Lewis. I teach the fiction of C.S. Lewis. And the third is Bible as literature. Okay. So <clears throat> I think one of the lectures I've been listening to is, I mean, so I've been, I've been listening to, to several, not every single one, but when I, when I get a chance and, and I have a few minutes, uh, I'm listening. And so years ago when I was in a uh, teaching in a public school, we offered uh, a public high school for a couple of years, a Bible as history and literature class. Okay. And I, I taught that uh, the students were a little bit disappointed because they were expecting Sunday school with, oh. you know, perhaps flannel graph. I'm not sure that, that was <laughs> probably a little bit after their time, but they're expecting something very mild and it was a little bit more stringent than that. But Many people, well, I mean, Christians, if they've been raised around the Bible, they don't often see the Bible as a book of ancient literature. Hmm. They just see it as the Bible, and it's it's in one stack over here, and then everything else is in another stack somewhere else. Hmm. But you talk about, you know, your class is, you know, the Bible as literature. So, you know, can you take us through what makes the Bible, how, how does it fit as a work of ancient literature? Hmm. And what are some of the genres it contains? Yeah, so it's a complicated topic. Uh, I Normally, I think there, there's a resistance to looking at the Bible as literature amongst evangelicals at any rate. Um, in part because that's how the liberals look at the Bible as a work of literature. And, and with that, they tend to 
emphasize that uh, that is the liberals uh, that it is just a story or it's just a myth um, and they're denying or at least or at the very least looking away from what what Christians will acknowledge that it's the word of God um, and so literature is a means of of, of undermining the purpose of scripture and uh, so there's a resistance to even consider it as scripture. There's an immediate assumption on the part of the audience, uh, if they are Christian, that you're doing something that they're not going to like, and probably as a you know surreptitious way of uh, attacking them, and you know you're acting like a false teacher by doing this. The problem with that view, although it's true, it it can be done that way, but the difficulty is that you then have to confront the fact that, that the Bible is extraordinarily well written <clears throat> and it's not uniform in the way it presents itself to us. So uh, everyone knows the Psalms uh, and Proverbs and Genesis and there are certain texts that people read more regularly than others, the Gospels, the Epistles, and you can't read them all the same way. It just simply doesn't work. And and there are other parts of the scriptures that where when you try to read it as narrative or uh, or as sort of more flat teaching like we find in the epistles, you find that it's very frustrating. And in fact, it won't allow you to read it that way. And you end up just saying, well, I'm not going to read those books. <laughs> I'll, I'll ignore the book right. of Job because it's just plain crazy. I'll ignore the prophetic works, you know, the 12 prophets, because they, I don't even know what's going on here. Um, right. It certainly doesn't read like a story and it doesn't, there's not a narrative per se. Um, and uh, the Psalms, well, they're, I can, I can, I like those. They sound like personal reflections. Most of them. Most of them. Um, proverbs are sometimes, oh, those are pithy. I like those sayings. But books one to nine, what's going on there? Two women in the streets, that um, that's clearly not realism. So I, I, you end up with all sorts of problems if you take the Bible as the word of God, which we do, with reading certain books in the Bible uh, and not just throwing them away and say, well, I'm not going to read that because it's it doesn't seem to me to be presenting itself as as hard doctrine and that's the way I want to see it. And I I'm taking the Bible seriously. So you end up not taking the Bible seriously as a result. And so I'm trying to read the Bible the way I think the Bible needs or demands to be read. And that does include genres then to consider the genre as one of the features of that. And even things like narrative, the, I, I emphasize the majority of the Bible is written in terms of narrative but narrative has, again, certain features. There's a narrator. Um, there's also um, actors, as it were, in the text, speakers. And we learn what's going on through their dialogue, um, which is not the way we, when we think of narrative, we think of a narrator telling us the story. But that's not the way the Old Testament tends to tell its story. It lets the speakers interact with one another and that's how the story is told so it's very artfully done and my aim is simply to read it the way it is intended to have been read and uh, so to confront the problem of misreading which uh, we're not really given preparation for reading things well these days i mean people go to schools they go to public schools they're they tend to be given bad literature not well written, and it tends to be certain, a uh, very few types of literature. They tend to be novels, right? And novels tend to be a narrator. They don't tend, to, and they don't tend to have the dialogue in this to the same degree we find in the Old Testament and even in parts of the New Testament. And they just don't know how to read it. And so I'm trying to equip students to to read it well and thereby be acquainted with. If we say it's the Word of God honoring it in the way it's written is honoring God. That's what I'm trying to do there. Right. I'm, do, I'm doing it 
again, it's not my specific purpose is not doctrinal, but I say that part of the uniqueness of the scriptures is that it is a religious text. It is, it is literally the word of God. It's God breathed. So therefore I need to accept that, never deny that, always observe that. And at the same time, note, but it, it comes to us in however many different forms and let's look at them. Um, so, yeah. One of the things in your lecture on Job that it, it, it came to my mind, I remember you talked about how there are portions in Job that, and I can't remember exactly how you said it, but, but I mean, of course, Job is poetry mm -hmm. and you contrasted that with other uh, ancient literature where you have uh, the settings for a play and, and even the instructions for, for, for what the setting should be is, is mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And I was reminded of the Psalms and, you know, kind of the, those portions that we don't hold necessary, I don't to be inspired text, the instructions at the beginning, a Psalm of David in this particular setting, it reminded me of other works of, Greek literature where you would have a chorus mm -hmm. who would be, you know, and, and that they would have a part in this, this presentation. And I, I, a particular Greek play does not come to mind right now, but, but the similarity of the two struck me when I was listening to your lecture. And I thought that is, that's something that I thought was specific only to the Greek literature that I'd read, but then you have something approximating that in the Psalms as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, some of the, again, one of the challenges whenever you read any text is, is our assumption that all texts uh, are easily understood and that we don't have to do any work uh, to access them. And we get, as I say, we get really frustrated by that. And we just tend to put them down then. So I don't understand this. I don't, I'm going to put that aside and I won't read it. And again, I think if we are saying that the Bible is the word of God, the whole, it's the whole Bible. The Bible is these 66 books from different authors in different eras. And the entirety is scripture. Jesus quotes Job. It's, he cited in uh, in Hebrews as well um, as a scripture, but it's a very different sort of scripture than the story of Abraham, which is cited. And how do I read that? And how does it make sense? And it's a very difficult book, Job. I think it is extraordinarily difficult. And one of the difficulties is it doesn't seem to be realistic. It, it's so it starts with a man who is extraordinarily blessed and so much so that Satan meets God. Where, where on earth is he meeting God in the heavenly places? Well, what's he doing up there? What is that? What's going on there? And why is God talking to him? Does he not know who he is? And, and why does he go along with God? Uh, or why does God go along with Satan's desires to test Job? He does. However, he goes, you know, Satan says, if you, if you took away all those things, he wouldn't bless you anymore. He's just doing it because you, you treat him well. That's why he thinks you're great and he praises you. God says, go ahead, take away those things from him. But don't don't take away his life. So it, he's, it starts well. He takes away those things. His wife tells him to, you know, curse God and die. And he doesn't do that. And he goes through this enormous trial of three men who are his friends, orthodox, telling him he must have done something wrong because God is just and you're a sinner. And of course, these things, uh, you deserve what you had. Don't you realize that you're a sinner? And he said, yes, I do, but I didn't do anything. And of course, we, the reader, are aware that this is true because that's how the whole thing was introduced. It's not because Job has done anything wrong. It's because there is a, there's another purpose here. And what is that purpose then? It seems to be to demonstrate 
Job's faith, that it's not because of his circumstances, and we will demonstrate that by taking away all of the things that would lead us to believe that he is praising God because he's receiving a lot of blessings in his life. We'll take away all the blessings and see what happens. And in the end, Job's very angry about this, of course. But at the conclusion of it, it it's like a fairy tale ending. He gets a new wife, he gets twice as many kids, he gets twice as many possessions. So it's it's like a fairy tale beginning, a fairy tale ending. Well, this is a strange way to present a a, his, a historical event, and I don't think it's realistic in that sense. Um, but I do think it's teaching something about the man of faith and the use of the the purpose of suffering uh, in proving faith. And I, I think it's talking about the same thing that uh, the book of Hebrews is is talking about. And if we didn't have it, uh, it wouldn't be as presented as realistically, because a lot of this is very highly emotive poetry uh, between angry friends. Job is angry. His friends are angry at him. They're denouncing him. They're they're all passionate about what they believe. But as we know, Job is right, and that's so. It's it's spiritually helpful. It's pastorally helpful to people who are suffering. Right. And um, I observe that about n- numerous books in Scripture that uh, if we don't understand the genre, we could we're going to misread it. And by misreading it, well, either we're not going to read it at all, or if we misread it we're going to see something else. And it sounds like if this is history, it sounds like God is being remarkably cruel. And the uh, endings of is it's remarkable. It's, it goes beyond Disney in terms of being too happy. You know, they all lived happily ever after. I, I think it has to be read as a sort of a, a myth almost, but it's a myth that teaches us something profoundly true. Well, on that note, you know, Tolkien called, I don't know, I can't remember if he was talking about the gospel or or just scripture in general. I, I cannot remember what he to what he was referring to, but something related to Christianity as the true myth, myth. the one true myth. So how so just briefly talk about the idea of what does a myth do in ancient literature? And, and why would Tolkien, I, I've had to deal with, talk to many people who said, see, Tolkien did not even believe the Bible. Couldn't have been a Christian. He called the Bible a myth. So it has to be false. So how is, you know, how could that be true? Uh, and, and how could the idea of I mean, what is in scripture, how could it be considered a true myth? Well, it, both Lewis and Tolkien, uh, and you're mentioning Tolkien here, but the same would hold true of Lewis. They loved uh, myths and, and stories, whether they found them in the Greeks and the Romans or in Norse mythology, as Tolkien preferred. Um, but they noted that uh, in the stories, the pagan stories of old, there were truths being communicated that were not wholly true, and they wouldn't have regarded it that way, but but had analogies. Com- they were comparable to the Christian story, whether in the death of Balder, as in Norse mythology, he's killed and he is brought back to life. That sounds a lot like a death and resurrection. Or you could do the same thing with Bacchus, the wine god who is slaughtered and gets brought again back to life. Lewis talks about him in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, but the way that these myths are, in some senses, foreshadowing the the true myth, which is the way they talk about uh, the the Christian faith, because again, it presents itself to us in miraculous terms. So this is a story, but it's a story in which history and all of the myths seem to conjoin. And Christ is the sort of nexus point of history in which um, there is an incarnation of myths made fact. And this is how Tolkien explained the Christian faith to Lewis, who loved myths and was an atheist. And he said, but all of the stories that you love 
the reason that you love them is because they are they remind you of this myth and this myth just happens to be true and the, it's the truth of those other myths that is what is so appealing to you it's not just a diversion and entertainment you think that there's something profound being articulated in those myths and yet only in the god man jesus do we see the uh, significance of all these stories that you see scattered all over the place and love being fleshed out as it were where the word becomes flesh and dwelt among us that's that's the story of john's gospel and it is in some sense picked up in the ancient myths of again greece rome norse and i suspect other cultures as well to a lesser extent um but that it's it's absolutely pivotal for lewis's own conversion and to some degree for me when i'm reading stories and legends and myths i see something of that myself in the stories of the world and this fits in with our idea of common grace that god uh, speaks to all people in all ages you know the sun sets on the righteous and the unrighteous and he he gives gifts to all people and there are blessings that come from that world and and it's not only the blessings but even the stories are part of that common grace i think and and again it's not that the god leaves us without signposts and Paul talks about that in Romans that uh, the invisible things of the world uh, or, or of of God are are seen in the created order. The heavens declare the glory of God, uh, and also, but again, even the stories. But they're not unambiguous, and they're filled with with falsehoods and idolatries, as Augustine notes. But still, there's something there, and that's uh, that's what it, I think Tolkien is talking about. So in, in moving from ancient literature to, you know, after that, and of course, Lewis called, <laughs> called the time from ancient literature, the, you know, the long middle ages, mm. uh, that, that, that extended period all the way through even, you know, the, the Renaissance and, and so on. But how does, I mean, culturally the gospel Christ comes and he, the church is established, and then, as you said, that is the, the the pivotal point in history. And from there, the world, where wherever the gospel goes, and we see this in in Europe, this thing called Christendom develops, and it is reflected in its literature. It's demonstrated in its literature. So, how does medieval literature and from say Beowulf all the way through and you can, can wherever you're wherever you think medieval literature stops if it's pre-enlightenment or whenever that is how does that reflect how, how does that literature reflect Christendom it's a very good question um, so we you asked me about the genres in scripture <clears throat> I look at the genres and and often in scripture the the pagan genres, and we get the notion of the genres from the pagans. They they uh, give us the critical vocabulary and the concepts and uh, and the and and the language even to describe them, like a tragedy or a comedy. We get we get that from the Greeks, and we apply them to scripture to help us to understand what's going on here. But when we do that with scripture, we find that we are encountering something that doesn't really quite fit those categories. It does and it doesn't. It's sort of like the myths of the ancient world and the true myth of Christianity. So it does help us to talk about it, and yet we see something in Scripture which transcends that and is doing something different. And I would say that that's what we get as we see the medieval uh, transformation of the pagan world. We see it being Christianized. And so the stories of old are like Tolkien with the the uh, sword of Elendil. He's going to reforge the sword. It's and it's being recast in terms that are compatible with the Christian view of life. Uh, the idea that God took on human flesh and uh, that He brought about a kingdom in the midst of the kingdoms of this world is the kingdom of God, and they are at 
odds with one another and they coexist. And the two cities that Augustine talks about, the city of God and city of man, are almost on top of one another. And the one breaks through uh, the kingdom of God uh, within the kingdom of this world and the light shines in the darkness, the city on the hill, etc. Those are all those are metaphors that scripture uses for the kingdom of God and how to act and so forth. But the, so it's a way of engaging with the culture in which we find ourselves and transforming it. We talked about the outset about the long, slow march to the left, but actually the gospel, it has its own long, slow march and it's just, it's longer and it's slower and it's more profound and it, it, to some degree, I think that's what's going on in our technological age is that they are trying to undo what the gospel has done culturally. It, so it's, it's, it's supported the pagan view of the importance of the family, but it's transformed it in so far as it's given a greater dignity and uh, a different understanding of the persons involved there. Uh, women are regarded as image bearers of God in the same way that men are. And the, the, the whole concept of an image bearer of God used to only be applied to the kings, the pagan kings of old. They, were, they bore mm -hmm. the image of God, but not men, not men right. uh, as in males. Those were not image bearers. It was just kings. Well, now we apply it to, to men, but not only men, to women, and not only women, but children. They all are image bearers of God. Well, those are profound transformations of a pagan view of human nature. And again, contemporary views are trying to desacralize or depersonify all of those individuals from the children who were happily, happy to abort to the elderly who were happy to euthanize out of compassion in both cases um, to Again, fathers and mothers now who are happy to delegitimize as caregivers for their own children. We're going to get the state do that, um, take on that role. Um, so it it is a for me. I I present it in terms of literary text and just observe, and you can do it by comparison. So I have an epic here. Let's look at this epic in the Greek era. And here's another epic in the Roman era. Here's an epic in the Mid Middle Ages. Here's an epic, I'll do this next semester, with Milton. And look at the points of comparison, look at the point of contrast, and now we can talk about the way in which Christianity changes things. And does it change it for the better? And I think it decisively does. It, it not only changes it, but improves it. And then when we get to the Enlightenment, which is informs our age, it also changes it, but does it do it for the better? And I argue strongly, it does not. It It is actually um, going against the pagans and the Christians, and it, it's going against our own human nature. It's depersonifying us, and uh, and that's not a good thing, and we're, we're seeing the terrible consequences of that. So I am presenting the gospel in a, in a more of a systematic or full, fully orbed way, um, I think, uh, in a way that will be able to give us what we don't have in churches is uh, an apologetic for Christian culture. Right. We do have a, you know, appeal for people to come to faith in Christ because he is the Lord, which is right. But how do I live my life? And what's the, what, what, will that make the world a better place if, if I believe in him? And I think the, the answer is decisively yes, it does, which is not to deny that Christians have ever done bad things historically. That's absurd. Sure. Nobody needs to hold that position that they have to, you know, defend every crazy thing that a Christian has done. Crusade. Crusade, whatever. Whatever. Even the Crusades you could provide a defense for actually. Oh sure, yes, yes. But, but, I mean, but I, you don't I, have I, to you don't have to agree with everything that has ever been done by somebody who calls himself a Christian. Right. Right. So then in conclusion with all of that, and well, so, so I'll, I'll start with saying I love the way you present that with the contrast of, you know, ancient epic, mid, you know, early medieval 
later medieval and then enlightenment. I think that, that that's a wonderful apologetic method for Christian culture. And, you know, I, I, I wish people would do that as well for politics, for economics, for, you know, history, which history and literature are very closely tied together, but, but, but that they would do that for other subjects as well. I think that would be a powerful motivation. But in conclusion, then, there, there are a lot of parents and Christian teachers who listen to the podcast. So, so for you as a, uh, a professor, how would you suggest to parents and teachers to, to help prepare and, and guide and, and fortify their children for, I mean, we don't know what's coming. We have no idea. No, but we do have what we're called to raise our children in the paideia of God. So, how you know what are things? And I know this could be an entire talk, but a few things that parents can do or teachers can do related to your field in in, in literature and, and and things like that to help fortify their kids. Well, I'm thankful that you know the uh, the homeschooling movement over the last. 40 odd years has been enormously beneficial to parents in uh, not just as a movement against the public system, um, which is really operating on goods that they've inherited from our Christian forebears and are diminishing them by, by the year. They're, it's losing the benefits that were once there. Um, the result of parents pulling themselves their kids out of the system has meant that there's a market there for books and materials that will equip them to do that. And the materials are increasingly good. They really are. Um, now, I, I educate my kids classically, and I have found that the resources there are very much better than you will find in the state system, the public school system. It's just much superior. They read better books. They make connections between things that are presented as disconnected in the public system. And um, and yet, here's the problem. Most of us, I don't know about you, Matthew, but I was raised in the public school system. I was not taught to connect things in that system the way I want to understand them as an adult. No, as a Christian uh, convert, adult, I then pushed myself to make the connections that I had not been given. And I try to pass those down uh, to others so that because I know that the public schools are even worse now than when I went through the right. system and they're even more uh, confused and discouraged um, from even from learning, uh, let alone from understanding uh, things and being able to deeply sense a, a meaning and a purpose in all things. And so that's what that's why I put out my YouTube lectures was to equip people who and our parents like me who are not really equipped to do that task because they themselves never got that education. How am I supposed to give what I don't have? You can't. You can't give uh, somebody else what you don't have yourself. So you need to educate yourself. And that's why I put the lectures out there for common consumption. Um, it's not all of the lectures I've done, but it's it's a fair few of them. I've been doing it for a few years now. And um, and there's other things there. There's me doing some culture wars, TV, radio type stuff. It's, again, a lot of that's been lost. But um, <clears throat> So I think that what, what parents need to do to do the paideia of God is to educate themselves. They need to read great books, but they need to read them as Christians. I mean, that's what I've tried to do is to help those parents. Uh, by putting that out there, and not just Christian parents. That's one of my audiences, uh, intended audiences. It's also just random people on the internet. Um, right. Because I, I have a, glo with YouTube, it's a global audience. It's fascinating. I get people writing me from, I've had people write me from Nepal, from India, from <laughs> Pakistan, from Africa, from South America, um, from r literally all over the world and they ask for advice on things sometimes, you know, <laughs> and I, it, it's extraordinary. I think I, I didn't, I, I didn't really think about this when I began, 
And it's not right. like my reach is that big. I'm not, you know, I don't have billions or millions of subscribers, but the audience for YouTube, it grows by the year. Right. And, yes. uh, and I think there's a great need for what I am currently doing um, yes. on my YouTube channel. And I'm not sure that they're even going to get it in the university in most places. I don't think there are many Christians in the academy anymore who have the knowledge base that I do and can convey it in an integrated way. And, and so, but if they don't cancel me, it's evergreen. People can always go there and they can educate themselves. And, and so I, I was yes. trying to do a public service by recording. It is a wonderful public service. And again, I, I said earlier that you, you had the, the courage to do that. I, I think, honestly, many professors don't put their lectures out there because they're pretty terrible. <laughs> uh, not just in content, but you know, they have all the personality of a stick and mm -hmm. it is something that, I mean, you, you would give it to, to prisoners of war if you're trying to make them hate life, but you would not <laughs> want to put it, give it, well, I, you could consider students prisoners of war in some universities, but, <laughs> uh, prisoners of the culture war, but still it, it is a wonderful resource and I'm grateful that you are recording it. So my personal prayer is that the Lord will grant you opportunity and time to turn this into to a, a book or several books because it would be very valuable. So well, th thank you for that. I, I did a series of podcasts called Paideia Today as well with a friend and colleague of mine, Bill Friesen, and it's the two of us talking about great books. I will put a link to that. I know it is on your website. Uh, yeah. And your, what, what is your website for anyone who wants to, to, to visit? Well, my personal website is scottmasson.ca, but I think there's a Paideia Today website as well, and I think it's paideiatoday.com. I... Okay. Well, I will search that out and and put a link to it. So, yes, anyway. It's there. Okay. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Masson, for your time. This has been excellent, and I believe it'll be a, a great help. And thank you again for, for all the, the work that you put in with your students, but also that you put online. It, it's a blessing to God's kingdom. Well, thank you for your kind words. God bless you all.